realize we do have a full house and we have had in the last few weeks some technical difficulties. Can everybody in the back of the room hear me? Good. Um, so item number one, welcome and join us to the special meeting of the Town Council for the July 22nd. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order. Item number two is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please rise and join me? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And item number three is roll call. Councilor Baybine. Present. Councilor Donovan. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor St. Clair. Here. Councilor Blaze. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Council Chair Holbrook. And I am here too. And so this evening, which I'm sure all of you are here for, we do have our public hearing and second reading on the school budget. Before we do that, I do have a few opening comments, and then I do believe a member from the school board will have some comments as well. Um, so certainly, you know, we uh, over the last few weeks have had a lot of discussions and, and a lot of um, votes and, and votes cast and um, thought it was pertinent at this point to have our um, elected officials and kind of come together and meet as some of the leaders. Um, so we've been meeting uh, myself as the chair of the council, again with Mr. Babine, who is our finance chair um, this year, as well as with a, um, members of the school board, which would be the um, chair, Mrs. Bailey, and their finance chair, Mr. Chiazzo. Joined with us in some of those discussions was our town manager and the superintendent. And um, certainly, you know, the, the community is expecting some form of leadership and some form of a problem-solving measure to come forward. And it's also expected that some level of a compromise be struck and reasonably endorsed by this council at this point, as well as with the school board. So in the spirit of compromise and by nature and in trying to find some middle ground, um, and, and by definition, I say middle ground and compromises that nobody is happy with the outcome. So I do want to open that statement with this will not be a budget that anybody loves. The municipal will not be level service and neither will be the school, but what can we do to be some middle ground? So we we're looking forward. Um, there's been a lot of work and a lot of discussion over the last few weeks. Um, some lost vacation time on my end. <laughs> Um, and, and I guess I, I would just like to end with, at this point, um, and some of the motions that will be coming forward this evening, it's my sincere hope, and I would encourage everybody in the community at this point to recognize we have to move forward. And I would strongly encourage you to support the amendments that will be coming forward this evening, although I can't say until obviously the votes happen that we will be unanimous, but I think certainly we will be somewhat close to the belief of this is a middle ground, this is the best package we can offer moving forward for this year. Um, so moving forward, um, just to let the cat out of the bag, that certainly um, 70000 is what's on the table. Um, and, and at this point, um, frankly, there's probably not a whole lot else to go with this budget. Again, we're, we're reduction, reducing operating costs of 180000 out of the municipal with a $70,000 increase um, down from the original request of 500000 That puts us in the 250000 with the school. Um, again, that's feeling some pretty shared burdens on, on both departments. So with that, if that motion goes through this evening, we will be looking at an achieved tax rate increase of in the vicinity of 2.9%, which is, again, I think the best that we're going to hope for out of this budget this year. Um, so with that and those comments, we'll go ahead and open the floor to um, Mr. Chiazzo. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to address the council this evening. Uh, it's been a long and difficult few weeks for us all. Few issues seem to energize and often divide our community like the budget season. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's certainly, uh, that's certainly evident over the last few years as each year it's taken multiple rounds of voting to achieve a final voter approval of the school budget. Regardless of which side of the issue you're on, I believe the one thing we can all agree is that the continual discourse is not good for our community. As elected officials and leaders of the community, we choose to accept the roles we've been elected to fulfill. As such, we are rightfully held to a higher standard. The community looks to us to set an example of capable leadership. 
This is a great responsibility and no one, excuse me, and one I believe that none of us take very lightly. It is thus incumbent upon each of us to listen to both sides, be respectful of each other, regardless of our individual positions, and act in a collaborative manner to work to resolve the town's problems. The leadership of both the council and the board have been in discussions recently to find that common ground. While there was, there was and will continue to be much discussion around the details of the motion that you will consider tonight, we were and continue to be respectful of each other's positions. Webster defines compromise as an agreement or a settlement of a dispute that is reached by each side making concessions. The town cannot move forward with the education of our children or the business of governing until this compromise is achieved. It's clear to me that the majority of the citizens in this town want us as leaders to find that middle ground and present <laughs> solutions to the voters that we can all live with. While it most likely won't be the perfect solution for either side by any stretch of the imagination, we as leaders of the community have a responsibility to govern in a manner that's reflective of the morals and ideals of our community. I can't promise you that the compromise will not affect programming at our schools. However, I will promise you that the board will continue to do its duty in good faith and identify the areas that will have the least impact on the day-to-day -day activities of all of our students. As leaders, we should constantly be evaluating what works and what needs improvement in our town. Both the council and the board have agreed that the budget process we have in Scarborough is flawed. We have both made great strides this year in improving our communication, collaboration, and transparency in this process. While there is still much to accomplish, my hope is that you will approve the amendment before you this evening and that the voters will pass this budget. The extremists on both sides will likely view the compromise as the beginning of the end. As one parent so eloquently put it last week, I would rather be grateful and consider this the end of the beginning so that we can get on with the most important work of educating our children, governing and improving the structural needs of our community, and getting on with our later lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chiazza. So at this time, this is the public hearing for, uh, for the school budget. If you would like to speak, please rise, come to the podium, state your name and address. You have three minutes. Again, there's our lovely little, almost like a road light, red, green, and yellow. You, um, when you have 30 seconds, I believe, is one when minute. the yellow light. One minute. One minute. I'm morning. sorry. You change the timer. And um, don't be shy about lining up if you wish to speak. Good evening. Amy Glidden, 104 Ash Swamp Road. Um, in June, I voted yes too low on the school budget referendum. I woke up the next morning feeling optimistic. After all, the Town Council and the Board of Education worked tirelessly and collaboratively all winter and spring to bring forth that budget. I had never seen such teamwork between the two groups in 16 years of residency. However, I soon became disheartened that our school budget did not pass. My disappointment increased when I learned how few of my Scarborough residents voted. I determined that voter apathy was alive and well in our sleepy little town. When you later decided to cut 500000 from an already lean education budget, a grassroots effort led to the beginnings of a new group titled Supporters of Scarborough Schools. This becomes the silver lining in this challenging process. Supporters of education in Scarborough have awakened and realized that we cannot merely expect that education will be a top priority in our town. This group consists of residents from all walks of life. It includes young, single professionals, as well as retirees and senior citizens. It includes parents of children who have yet to start their education in Scarborough schools, as well as parents like me, whose children are finishing their last one to three, to three years in the Scarborough school system. It includes folks who took the time to meet individually with members of town council this week to present our message. This group is committed, bright, collaborative, and determined. Just look at how successful it was with the no too low message in a very short period of time. This group is also here to stay and willing to do the hard work necessary to lobby our town council and board of education to support our schools by funding it appropriately. Tonight I ask you to restore $250,000 to the education budget, but I promise you that, the, that supporters of Scarborough schools will be proactive and organized moving forward through the years as we commit to sending the message and the expectation that our schools need to be funded at level services each year. 
Our town has a moral and fiscal responsibility to provide no less. It is important to note, as you make your decisions tonight, that $250,000 back to the budget is $250,000 less, $250, less than the town council endorsed in the May budget. Thank you for your time and your service. Katie Fellows, 36 Orchard Street. Time is very much running out for my boys. Their public education is half complete. They are missing so many opportunities due to cuts. And it will be hard to recover current service levels before they have graduated, which is why I'm thrilled to see and be part of this sea of red, a long overdue movement of supporters of education in our town to take back our schools. This summer, this coming November, next year, we're here to stay. I think the emergence you saw a couple weeks ago in the middle of summer during a holiday week with two weeks to mobilize will prove the tip of the iceberg. I'm not here tonight to get into the weeds regarding stats or funding sources, contractual obligations and the like. <coughs> I'm thankful for all of our elected officials uh, whose role it is to make such analyses along with our professional staff. I'm here to wear red, think red, and preach red for those who cannot yet vote themselves. I support as high a funding level for our school system as can pass this council and hope that next year's council will do more. In my slightly modified version of the Seuss classic, The Lorax, the self-centered onceler shares his late in life regrets with the boy. All that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, I just couldn't guess. That was years ago now, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years, while our schools have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, now that you're here, this word seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Bram Thurl, 14 Freedom Road. At first, I'd like to say thank you. I've learned a lot in the last two weeks. I am uh, slowly um, picking up as much as I can. The information I found online and has been uh, dispersed. I appreciate it. Um, I welcome the uh, work that you've done to try and restore the 70,000. But in my heart, I believe it's our duty to the teachers and students of this town to restore the level services budget. My wife and I have two boys. The eldest is seven, entering second grade at Eight Corners, and our soon-to-be four-year-old will be starting there next fall. <coughs> my wife and I have volunteered in these classrooms. She is a classroom assistant and myself as a math tutor. We have seen that our teachers are overburdened and in need of more resources. The large classrooms, the need for specialized training in regards to special needs children, and the modern classroom dynamic demands that we help them as much as we can. I appreciate the school board's attempt to soften the blow when asked to eliminate 500000 But from where I stand, it does a huge disservice to our teachers and to our children. According to the Tennessee Star Student Teacher Achievement Research completed between 85 and 89, random students from kindergarten to third grade were placed in classes, some with small classes and some with large classes. The students in smaller classes, 13 to 17 students, performed about 5% higher on standardized tests in both math and reading. The SAGE program in Wisconsin noted that the first grade SAGE students gained about two cents a standard deviation unit across all tests, the result of classes between 12 and 15 students as compared with classes between 21 and 25 students, those outside the program. I'm not a fan of standardized testing, but when studies show over and over again that a low student teacher, uh, low student to teacher ratios produce measurable returns, then having classrooms with over 15 to 17 students holds our children back. My son Reed's first grade class has 21 students. 21. As it currently stands, we are not doing the best we can to help our students reach their full potential, nor equipping our teachers to outperform. So when people say that the 250,000 cut in phase one will not impact academic programs, mm -hmm. that short changes the students and teachers who are directly affected by those cuts. 111,570 explicitly impacts 
the hiring decisions uh, process for teachers, online resources and subscriptions, and three classroom instructional resources. These three items greatly contribute to importing, empowering quality teachers to help our children realize their full potential. In my mind, restoring phase two is a must. Investing in teachers is the surest way to invest in our children. And I believe phase one goes too far. Thank you for your time. Sophia Derda, 6 Haystack Circle. I will be going into seventh grade this year. I believe that school funding is the same place and increase in some cases. The budget isn't being wasted as it costs a certain amount to educate all the students. And there isn't enough currently for extracurricular activities. As a student, I believe that the community <coughs> should give schools enough money to help students succeed. Without clubs, sports, and activities, schools lose part of what makes them fun and unique. If things get cut, I would find school unexciting and without something to look forward to. Scarborough has to be held accountable for making sure kids get a good education for a bright future. In closing, schools deserve funding because with no things to look forward to after school, some part of school would be empty and unfulfilled. With the right encouragement, Scarborough schools can make an exceptional student experience and a better town for all of us. Thank you for your time. <coughs> My name is Emma Hartle, and I reside at 236 Black Point Road. I'll be going into my senior year of, at the high school. I've grown up all my life going to Scarborough schools ever since my first day of kindergarten at Pleasant Hill. As a little girl, I loved the question why, and I can always remember my parents explaining to me that Scarborough had one of the best school systems in the state that they loved, and a good school, and a good school system would lead me towards a successful and happy life. I've met some of my biggest role models in the Scarborough school system, and I've had amazing opportunities. However, lately, I've been saddened by hearing my parents and the parents of others telling me, thank God you're getting out now, because they see that the schools of Scarborough are not being given the basic funds that they deserve. <clears throat> Every year now, it's becoming a battle to pass the budget, even though to me it seems simple. We should be providing the schools here with enough money to provide for the kids who, unlike me, still have years to go until their graduation. Don't they deserve the same funding and programming that I had growing up in an exceptional school system? As a town, we should be investing in the future. I know you've amended to put back the money that cuts clubs and sports for about more than just that. In order to thrive and produce productive and marketable future workers and citizens, our schools should be given the full level, the full level services budget. <coughs> now let me address the counter argument. I know that people may overlook me because I'm just a teenager, and I don't pay taxes, so how could I possibly understand? But I know that Scarborough citizens who genuinely cannot pay their taxes can look for help in tax relief. And if that tax relief is not, as, if, if that tax relief is not effective, as was pointed out in the last meeting, then it is my hope that the town council steps up and works something out with the state legislature so that those who truly cannot afford the taxes in Scarborough are able to live where they love and our school system remains funded the way it should be. Thank you. My name is Will Rowan. I live at 14 Bonnie Grove Drive. I do not want to see anyone lose their home over property taxes. It isn't something we can vote on, but I'd like to see more spending on tax relief for people who truly need it. That said, the first budget in June was a compromise budget. It was not an investment in our schools intended to restore their strength. It was a budget that has us continuing on a steady path of decline and it was narrowly defeated. The second vote was a budget reduced by half a million dollars. Almost 90% of the voters who showed up voted against it. Many people are upset because that cut was so unprecedented. Last year's reduction was very large, but not this large. Prior to that, we've had very modest adjustments following failed referendums that were both too high and too low. I think we can all agree that this process is not working well and that we need to move on. Um, $250,000 is still a very large reduction from a level services budget, um, and I'm, I'm just not sure it can pass. On the other hand, the fiscal picture has improved dramatically since June. There's an additional $200,000 in excise taxes and almost $900,000 from the state. The school budget, though, has not increased. Rather, it's been decreased significantly. So what I'm arguing for is the difference between a projected 2.9% tax increase and a projected 3.3% tax increase, which would be the full half million dollar restoration. 
on the average home in town that comes out to about $20. But projected is the keyword. It's projected because we don't yet know what the town gross property valuation is. That valuation is the sum of all the taxable property in town. And every year we take our budget and we divide by the total valuation and we come up with our tax rate. And then we each pay our share based on the value of our individual property. So the higher that that gross valuation comes in, the less we each have to pay in taxes. So we want that number to go up. And how do we do that? That's by having people and businesses move here. And maybe for the same reason that I did in 2009, which is strong schools. Strong schools make a town more attractive and also protect property values in a recession. We want families to move here. Kids are only in school for about 13 years, and the marginal cost to the student, which is the additional cost of adding just one student, is much less than the average cost. So I also got curious about that gross valuation figure used for this year's projection. If you look on your sheet from last time, it's exactly $20 million over last year's number, or roughly half a percent. So I went to the assessor's office, and I looked at the last six years of gross valuation. The average growth over that time is twice the figure being used. If we restored the full half million dollars with the six-year average growth valuation number, our tax increase would be just 2.8%. But the average growth over the last three years is almost triple that number. The full restoration would result in an increase of just over 2.5%. So in conclusion, I think we can afford to do the full restoration of the June budget, and I think it would pass. Um, and I think the reduction should be more modest, just like in prior years. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sarah Mullen, and I live at 55 Gunstock Road. A successful and fully funded school system is a benefit to us all. Yes, more funding to the schools means a slight increase in taxes, but it is money well spent as it directly impacts our property values. In the greater Portland area, we are competing for new homeowners with a lot of great communities. And while Scarborough has a lot to offer that some of these other towns don't, like our beaches, those things will never trump a good school system for most homeowners. My husband and I moved here three years ago. When deciding where to live, we drew a line with a commuting distance to downtown Portland, and then we excluded any towns that didn't have good schools. And I would tell you, if we were looking today, Scarborough probably wouldn't make our list. Yes, our recent rankings in the schools are still fine, but our schools are getting worse and not better. And have you Googled Scarborough, Maine schools recently? The search results are horrible, and they don't paint a good picture of our school or of our town. And beyond the horrible publicity that this funding crisis has created, the breadth and volume of the academic and extracurricular cuts in the past few years is extremely troubling. It's really concerning for people like me who have children who are not yet school-aged. I have a two-year-old and a five-week-old. My daughters will graduate in the classes of 2031 and 2033. <laughs> yeah, a long time from now. And what will be left for them to participate in if every year there are more and more programs cut? And if I'm asking that question, other young families are asking that question. And if young families decide not to move here, all of our property values will decrease. I personally feel that anything less than a level services school budget is embarrassing for the town. That said, I totally recognize that this year the $250,000 back is probably a really good compromise. And I echo the statements of a lot of people before me that I feel like we're moving in the right direction in terms of voter engagement, and we should have been more engaged sooner. I know that I speak for a lot of people wearing red in this room in promising that we will be more engaged from the beginning going forward, and for me, that's an 18-year promise. <laughs> I'm Ann Valente. I live at 10 Sagebrush Drive. And those who know me know that uh, I am way out of my comfort zone uh, standing up here speaking tonight. Um, but what pushed me to get here was a recent visit from my sister from Aroostook County, 350 miles away, asking me, what's up with the Scarborough budget? And when I stopped and thought about our reputation and the reputation of the schools that my twin boys go to, it was time for me to stand up and speak. Um, people are talking. People all over the state are talking about this. Um, and it's time that we really compromise and, and move forward. Um, I'm a teacher. I teach in a neighboring school. I've been there for 24 years. I teach in Cape Elizabeth. And I have never um, seen 
in all of my years of teaching, parents have to fight as hard as these parents, myself included, had to fight for what our children receive in the school system. Um, and in fact, in Cape Elizabeth, things like foreign language was even added to, for younger grades. Um, middle school activities, uh, athletics are supported. And, um, and when I was first hired there, I, uh, I could have taken my, my boys with me as a benefit. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, the schools are comparable. They'll be okay here. But now I'm really starting to, um, to see the difference. And as I look around my own classroom, I teach third grade, and I look around the sixth grade classrooms that my boys were in this past year, um, I really see the difference in technology and other things. Um, I, uh, I don't know, thank goodness we have the teachers we do here because they have made the difference. And um, lastly, the, the, the thing that I want to say is um, tax increases are hard. They're hard for everybody, myself included. I'm a single mom. I work hard. I, work, I live paycheck to paycheck. But I would gladly support a tax increase if it affects my children and the children of our community. Thank you. My name is Ruthie Hemming. I live at 2 Howard Lane. First of all, thank you for all of the efforts that are being made on all fronts uh, to work towards a solution for our community. I wanted to share my thoughts, particularly, particularly with the seniors in this town who have expressed concerns about increasing tax rates when living on fixed incomes. I have always had an appreciation and respect for senior citizens. In part, I think I inherited this from my dad. My father has worked with seniors most of his career, from the time I was a child when he started an adult care program, or I would spend my school vacation days playing Scrabble and learning to knit, all the while learning valuable lessons about life from some remarkable people. Today, I enjoy my involvement with the senior population as a nurse, working with patients with age-related macular degeneration. Recently, I gained a whole new appreciation for the financial hardships that seniors face as they adjust to life on fixed incomes. As my parents retired last year from their full-time jobs and are now faced with having to work part-time jobs in order to maintain their lifestyle. This is after they sold their home and have moved into one that is less than half the size. Seniors shouldn't have to work in retirement, but it is a problem that cannot be fixed at the expense of our schools. I appreciate that there has to be some give and take and at some point sacrifices need to be made, but when it comes to whether or not we can afford to support education, the truth is we can't afford not to. If our schools cannot adequately prepare students for post-secondary education and the workforce, think of the implications 15 years from now when one in five Americans will be age 65 or older, more than twice as many as there were in 2000. Think of the impact on health care in terms of the increased number of nurses, doctors, other health professionals that are going to be needed to take care of our senior citizens. Isn't it in our best interest to make sure today's children are prepared for college and for professions that require good thinkers? Don't you want doctors and nurses taking care of you or your family someday to have gotten the best education they possibly could have? This is not going to happen with outdated textbooks and high student-teacher ratios. More than ever, we are going to need young people that are prepared for the challenges of our world, young people who have learned how to be effective problem solvers, community leaders, and team players. How are these skills to be learned without a strong school system, one that supports the development and retention of effective teachers, one that provides the extracurricular activities that cultivate problem-solving skills and the value of community service and teamwork? Don't we want to invest in our young people now so that they in turn can someday invest their ideas, their energy, their time, and yes, their money too, towards solving the problems that today might seem unsolvable. Once again, looking ahead to 15 years from now, my hope is that my daughter, who is now five, will be in college, perhaps maybe even studying a career in healthcare. Who knows? I do know this, when that time comes and we look back on all of this, I truly hope that I will be able to tell her that despite all of our differences, this community came together, all generations, to support her future and the future for all of us. Please cons consider this future when you vote on August 4th. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, good evening. Wayne Keller, 7 Schooner Road. Uh, my wife and I graduated from university here in Portland area. And uh, upon that, we looked at different towns we would want to, you know, raise our children in someday. And we, uh, we looked online and decided to come to Scarborough. That was uh, back in 2005. We started our family here, and we lived here for about seven years, uh, upon which we had an opportunity to leave the state. And we did. We left to uh, upstate New York. Um, we lived there for about two years, and the town we chose uh, was once again something we based our decision on based on the school system rating. Um, after two years, we decided that we wanted to come back to Maine, and there was no question in our minds which town we wanted to come back to. We wanted to come back to Scarborough. So we spent six months, the better part, uh, looking for houses, looking for different things that we could find here back in Scarborough, not South Portland, not Cape Elizabeth, not Portland, Scarborough. Um, it's important that we preserve our town, preserve, preserve our education system. Uh, I understand this certainly presents challenges that stem from Augusta and other places, uh, but it's incumbent upon all of us to consider our priorities, and for myself and many of the other voters in the audience, uh, those priorities are our school system. So uh, I please you know, ask that given all the challenges you do have within the community that you consider our priorities here and um, help us to become stewards of our own community. Again, thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Robin Twombly. I live at 29 Pondview Drive. When I looked on the iWord.com, I looked for a definition of democracy. And now, of course, it's gone away. Um, but democracy is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And in a true democracy, everybody is treated equally and has equal rights. And within that, the majority of those people in the democracy make the decisions. And I think it's pretty clear from this week, from last week, and from the last vote what the majority is and what the majority wants. And I understand that compromise is a word that's been used quite a bit tonight and on Facebook and through the different groups. And I've been learning a lot in the last month trying to figure out how, how all of this works. But in my mind, compromise implies two equal sides coming together. And I don't think that that's the case in this situation. I don't believe that both sides are equal in numbers. I think the majority clearly stands for the school system. And based on that, I will not vote for anything less than level services. And I may be alone in that. I may not be part of the Red Sea or the Red Squall, as I saw on the Internet. But I feel that majority should rule, and majority has spoken, and majority hopefully will continue to speak that um, anything less than restoring level services is not what the majority wants. And I will do my homework. I will stay tonight. I will w stay longer than I did last time. Apparently I missed um, some key decision that was made regarding what the vote will be. And I will pay attention to who the town council are and wh who they who – they, put their allegiances with and how much they support the school system. And I understand I'm only one person. I understand there are hundreds and thousands of people, not hundreds of thousands, um, but <laughs> hundreds and thousands of people here supporting the school and they can make their own decision, but that's what mine's going to be. And I hope that other people will consider that, that a true majority is supporting the schools and not a compromise. Thank you. Deborah Fuse Shortman, 15 Fairway Drive. Unfortunately, in every town in America, there are people struggling financially. Many would still be struggling even if taxes were lower. We should find other ways to help these people and not limit the overall growth and prosperity of our town by trying to keep everyone as homeowners. We should also not be pitting one group needing help against another. For example, those in town with financial need versus our town's kids. As a primary care physician, I, treat, I not only treat medical problems, but I also provide information on community resources to people in need. Many people qualify for help and do not realize it. I have made a brief handout that I'd like to share, and some highlights are. There's a 211 main health line. Anyone can call it and investigate if there are agency services or support groups that meet their needs. Over 8,000 statewide services are listed. 
Southern Maine Agency on Aging here on Route 1. They provide information on food support services, financial assistance, wellness programs, chronic disease management, Medicare counseling, veteran support, adult day, day centers, and volunteer opportunities, to name a few. A few. Project GRACE. Some examples of services they are involved in are the Fuel Fund, Scarborough Food Pantry, School Nutrition Program, and Thanksgiving Baskets. New for 2016, people should know that there is going to be no state income tax collected on military pensions. There's the Maine Medical Center Residency Primary Care Clinics, which provide reduced cost of free medical care depending on income. There's the Med Access Program, a free program which works with all individuals to help lower their medication costs through discount programs. Also new for next year, many income brackets will be reduced. The Portland Press Herald stated those making $50,000 a year in income should expect approximately a $400 drop in their income tax bill in 2016. Those with a $30,000 income should expect about a $360 reduction, with further reduction in 2017. I will leave some copies here for everyone interested, and I would like to suggest the town consider a similar listing on their website. I would also welcome the various anti-tax groups, I don't know all their names, um, in town to take one to post on their websites so that people can help, the, so that people can find the real help that they need. Thank you. Right here. <coughs> uh, my, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, my name is uh, Alec Maberduke. I'm from Bayberry Lane here in Scarborough. Um, and thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak to you about your deliberations over the school budget. Uh, I spoke at this uh, podium a couple months ago uh, when you were developing the original school budget proposal, um, and I apologize for any redundancies, but I think some of it's worth repeating. Uh, my partner and I moved to Scarborough in 2011. We moved here from Portland for the same reasons that most people move to Scarborough. It's close to Portland, it has great natural amenities, uh, and it was reputed to have a great uh, school system. Uh, my partner and I don't have children, nor do we have any plan to have any in the future. Uh, however, I'm not a fool. I fully recognize the fact that home values and the quality of the area's schools are closely linked. We were confident that our house would be a good investment because many families we know uh, were moving to Scarborough to ensure their children get a quality education. We knew that if we decided to sell our house at some point, we'd be able to sell it you know, for a good, fair price. Uh, but we aren't the, uh, the only option, of course. Our Scarborough competes with Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, Yarmouth, and other coastal towns that boast the same competitive advantages. Um, but that's not the only competition we have to worry about, of course. Uh, increasingly, American workers are competing in a global market, and as a result, uh, long gone are the days uh, when we could educate our children you know, with nothing more than a blackboard in a, in a one-room uh, schoolhouse. Um, past generations had the vision and conscious, uh, conscience to invest in us, and I think we should have the same vision and conscience to pay it forward. $40 in my pocket uh, won't do nearly as much good as having extracurricular uh, you know, learning for our children. I believe your first budget was the right budget. Um, you may be able to defer some costs, uh, but that will only force you to make more dramatic changes to the tax code in the future. Um, but if you can muster a budget uh, for now uh, that keeps level services um, and is less than that original budget, then so be it. I can support it and I can vote for it, whatever that number may be. Um, the state has cut taxes repeatedly and paid for it by shifting costs to municipalities, as everybody here knows and has heard. Personally, I would have preferred that income tax to have stayed higher uh, because I think it's a fairer tax than uh, the property tax. Um, but that's a fight for Augusta. That money is now in all of our pockets, and I really uh, believe that we should be investing it in our schools and in our children. Hi, my name is Amy Spooter. I live on 10 Jana Lane with my, with my husband Nathan and our two daughters. 
First, I want to just thank you all on the town council for all of your service. I also want to just acknowledge, like many people have, how challenging the situation for <coughs> for everybody. And I hope that we can all come together for a compromise. Also, similar to many others, my ask is for you to restore a minimum of $250,000 back into the school budget. Um, there's been a lot of information shared tonight and over the last couple of weeks, so I just wanted to keep my points very um, targeted, and I wanted to focus on extracurricular activities and their importance. Things like band and sports, key club, and I had in here foreign language, although my friend Tina Pettengill uh, told me that that's not technically an extracurricular activity, but we can't ignore that. <laughs> um, overall, we invest a very small amount of money to these, and I really believe like they make a big difference in our children and the adults that they become. Research shows, and I think we've probably all experienced, that extracurricular activities help things like kids' learning time management and prioritizing. <coughs> it diversifies kids' interests, so extracurricular activities allows children to try different things in sort of a safe environment and see what they're good at and then uh, try again. Uh, it'll, it teaches them about long-term commitments. They're committed to something with an outcome, and it teaches them dedication. They learn about making a contribution and how they can make a difference. It also, I think it helps kids with their self-esteem because they do find things that they're good at and they like that and they get praised for that and it makes them want to go to school and want to stay after school and I think we all want that for our children. I think it also helps kids learn how to work with other people. It learns how to develop leaders. It learns how to work with people that may not be exactly like yourself. I think lastly, there's no question that these extracurricular activities also help uh, for college applications and to get people into good schools so that they become great community members. Unfortunately, over the years, Scarborough has had to reduce these activities, as we've heard, uh, little by little every year things get cut. And parents are also being asked to contribute more money to the activities that we do have. I did a little research with friends that I have in neighboring communities and people aren't being asked to pay for field trips or to pay activity fees and what they're being offered is so much more than what we have. So together I ask that we send a message to our students that the Scarborough community values diversity and the importance of learning outside of the classroom as well as in. Let's support our students as they work to get into the best colleges and universities. Let's help raise a community of leaders who learn the importance of working together to achieve a common goal. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Tina Pettengill. I live at 11 Hunter Point Drive uh, with my husband and three children. Um, I want to thank you all for your service and the countless hours that you and the school board have dedicated our children to this town as a whole. I've spoken to most of you this week, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm truly impressed by the dialogue we have begun and energized and excited to see what we can do together. I think many of us agree, uh, or I'm not certainly speaking for everyone, but I think many of us do agree that we don't necessarily have a spending problem, we have a revenue problem. Uh, I think I can speak for most of us in this room, though, when I do say that I think we're ready to be engaged in different uh, and better ways now and in the future not only with you all, but with legislators, um, school board members, and other diverse groups in our community. We're ready to be part of the healing of Scarborough, um, but in general, we are the parents of Scarborough and we're not going away. So I appreciate your time. Hi, my name is Dave Tate. I live at 10 Ryefield Drive, Scarborough, of course. Um, I didn't have a lot written down. I'm going to kind of just go off the cuff. I have five or four, four. I had five. I decided not on the fifth one. Four main points. Um, the first one is I'm really cheap. I don't like to spend money on anything. Um, anyone who knows me <laughs> will tell you that. I spent a year trying to buy a car. I spent two years trying to figure out what town to live in and get the best price on a house. I still haven't put the new floors in my house that I want to do or the counters in the kitchen. But when it comes to spending money on my kids and my education, I'm going to be here every time, my wife or I, to make sure that that money is spent. And I'm not going to worry about how much it's going to cost me overall. I do think, and I'm going to get to this in point three, 
Um, I'm going to go ahead to point three. I'm going to skip <laughs> point two and go right to point three. So point three is I don't understand why we're having this conversation only about schools. Um, I don't understand why raising taxes is a school thing or why the taxes have to go up and it's a school thing. There's an entire town budget that I don't know anything about. I mean, I know very little about. Um, but that's a part of this whole piece, too. And if we're going to have this discussion every single year and go through this struggle every single year when, the, when, when we have to come up with a, a school budget, um, then I think the whole thing should be opened up on some level so we can get the money, if not from the school budget, from somewhere else. Um, I need visibility of that. I'd like to have as much say on that as apparently the whole town does on the schools. Um, and to the point that everyone else made, um, buying a house in Scarborough, I flash back to the time my wife and I were buying a house, and, and we did the same thing that everyone else that came up here did. I put a peg in Portland, I put a peg in the beach, I put a peg where my parents live, and I made a big circle, and I figured out, and I Googled every town, I looked at every school, and I have Googled Scarborough, and it's embarrassing <laughs> when you put school Scarborough in there. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure I'd be here today if that was the case. I didn't know a whole lot about the area. I knew that Scarborough had a good school, uh, good school system. Um, I knew that um, I could afford it um, on the high end of what I could afford, but I could afford it. Um, and, uh, and that's what was a major uh, piece in my decision. And I think my decision would go in a different direction if I was, if I was making that choice now. And I think everyone should think about that because most of Everyone here, I'm sure, owns property in Scarborough. And if everyone's making that same choice and doing that same piece every time they move here, you can only uh, come to the assumption that that's not going to continue. So, because there are other options. Um, and the last point is um, just that I've seen the red. I don't wear red; it's not my color. Um, <laughs> but I, um, you see, you see all the support here and all the people here. Um, and if enough people, if all these people come out for this, they're going to come out again when we vote for town council. You can bet on that. So just keep that in mind. I've watched this closer this year than I have in past years across the board. Thank you so much. I think red is your color. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody else wish to speak on this matter? This is again. And again, if you do want to speak, do feel free to line right up. <coughs> Hi, my name is Liam Summers, Holmes Road, and I have two children, one in the uh, middle school right now and one who's 17 months old and uh, hopefully will be a beneficiary of uh, the Scarborough schools for her life as well. I'm a lifelong Maine resident. I went to every level of schooling in Maine from grammar school through college. Uh, and along the way, I had amazing teachers that got me uh, to where I am today. And without them, I would not be in front of you uh, or have the opportunities in my life that I have. So there's nothing more that I respect than what the work that our teachers do, typically on a shoestring budget. And I recognize the challenges that they have along the way. I'm not here to argue for or against a budget, because I think that discussion has torn this town apart to a degree that's not healthy and it's not getting us anywhere. All I want to do is address how do we go forward from here, and part of that is to understand facts and understand um, what the process will be going forward. So, and, and, I, and this isn't Common Core math, sorry. I, I wasn't in school when that came out, so I'm beyond me. I, I used to have hair, too, so I mean, it's been a long time since I've been in school. In 2015, the school budget was $36,167,345. In 2016, the proposed budget with the 180000 added in is $38,810,225. That comes from the school's budget page, town website. It's there for everybody to see. That's an increase of $2,642,880 this year, which is a 7.3% increase. That's fine. I don't care. I'm happy to pay that. All I want to know is, what do we do going forward? We don't represent just one segment of the population. It's not just me and my family that live here. It's a lot of families that live here. As a government, as a town, and as people, we have to be uh, more sensitive than just the needs of ourselves. So I, I have a few questions. Why is that increase not enough to provide level services? 
what percent increase does the Board of, of Education believe is needed to provide the level services? Whatever it is, throw it out there. Let's make sure that we can pay it. What is the increase projected for 2017, 18, and 19? We need to know this now, otherwise we're going to be back here next year. Let's not do that anymore. Let's get the facts on the table. If the school's underfunded dramatically, let's close the gap. Nobody wants the school to not succeed. What increase does the Board of, Direct, the Board of Education feel is reasonable as a recurring yearly increase? Whatever it is, let's just get it out there. Let's have the discussion now. We're adults. Let's figure it out together. And then the last thing I would say is we're talking about a, a small amount of money that we're, we're going to bicker over, 250000 bucks here or there. Let's stop it. The two low votes got 2,042 votes. If each one of those people wrote a check for $100, that's $204,200 that goes back to the schools. I will be the first one to write that check. If we want to help our schools, it takes more than just money. It takes engagement. It takes incredible teachers, and it takes a town that is willing to support not just themselves, but the others in the town. We can come together and do this. $100 a piece. We talked about $17 a day or $17 a week. $100 bucks a piece, and we fund it. Let's do that. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dr. Julie Muller. I live at 2 Ottawa Woods Road. Thank you for having us here to speak tonight. I teach political science at Southern Maine Community College, but I did not bring a flip chart or PowerPoints with me tonight. I didn't even bring a prepared written speech. I was going to address the Goldilocks question and the lack thereof, but I hear that is a, now a moot point because the ballots already had to be printed, so perhaps that's something to take up next year. Um, what I did want to say, though, is we're not a town divided. Look at this room. Even Liam's wearing red. <laughs> We're not divided. We all want to support the schools. And, you know, I thought the first budget was really fair. I didn't like it. I voted yes, but no, too, but too low. Because I've seen ever since we've had to start voting on this as a town, that every year something's gotten cut from the schools. And the school district that I moved here for in 2005, those schools don't exist anymore. We don't have an art show. We don't have foreign language in, the, in Wentworth, where it is an extracurricular activity right now. Um, and I, I don't think we're divided. I saw three people leave at the beginning of the meeting who were upset that so many of us were speaking in favor of the schools, but they didn't bother to stay and hear what we were saying. They said it was the same old bullpucky that we were saying. They didn't say that, but there's kids here, so I don't want to say what they said. Um, I don't think we're divided, and I think that we didn't come out at the first vote because we thought, well, this is pretty fair. Who could not support this? Mm -hmm. There's a few ideologues who are noisy in this town, and we all <laughs> um, have let them control the debate over our school budget and it's time to take that back. And we look to you, the town council, to lead in that. And I thank you, those of you who are willing to meet with supporters of the schools this week. Um, and we need you to take that leadership and say, we're going to do what's in the best interest of our town as a whole. And we're going to find a compromise that works for everyone. And then we, parents, right, we will get out and we will support you as much as we can. So thank you. Good evening. My name is Larry Hartwell. I live at 9 Puritan Drive in Scarborough. Uh, I've been here a few times before in talking about the budget. Uh, I don't have any prepared my room remarks tonight, but the fact is that, first of all, I remember a lot of parents here, I'm a proud Scarborough person. I'm proud of our schools. We have good schools here. This debate certainly has not helped us in the wider communities around the state, certainly. It's been very divisive. Um, the half a million dollar cut, the school budget, or the school board was able to do 320000 of that without doing significant harm to, to the to, uh, student services. Then they were presented by the superintendent with $180,000 remaining cut. And what did he go for? He went for 
clubs and sports. Now, you can't tell me, and I don't know why they didn't look at the other four. They got a $43 million budget. You can't tell me that they didn't even look at it to see if they could cut 180000 Apparently, we on the municipal side now are going to cut that budget, which was less than 3%, by 180000 Somehow, we're going to be able to do that in a budget of only $17 million, and the school budget has $43 million. So that's why, unfortunately, we're not enjoying this evening out. We're all here tonight. So, But I'd like to say in closing, I support the compromise. It is just what it is. It's not going to, you know, it's not something I like. It's not anyone in this room likes, but we need to simply move on at this point. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sakia Nelson. I'm an 18 Fairway. Thank you very much for your time tonight, and thank you for this, um, for the whole sea of red that I'm seeing here. I love to, I love being a part of it. Um, I do want to um, just mirror the all of the comments of the group um, of, in red that have spoken before me. Um, but what I just want to directly address is the. Um, I would like to request respectfully that you reconsider your decision to remove the Goldilocks question um, from the ballot. Um, I think the removal of that uh, in the middle of this budget um, process is um, problematic, to say the least, and also just ingenuous. Um, I'm a statistician, an uh, epidemiologist and statistician, and I can tell you <laughs> personally that it is a huge, huge no-no from a data perspective to ever purposefully lose data. <laughs> um, uh, and that's, you know, exactly what you're doing here. You're taking good data and you're dumping it. Um, it's That's dif different and distinct from taking valuable data and deciding not to use it or analyze it. Um, but you're actually taking perfectly good data and dumping it, not collecting it, and that's something that you know, from um, you know, from my perspective and from this field, is just something you never want to do. So, you know, I just I think that's I what I the situation that it creates I think is um, is um, a situation where you have data that becomes um, very difficult to interpret. So in the instance where if the budget does not pass and you have um, a bunch of no's, you have no idea what the breakdown is and what your voters are really saying. I think that's problematic. And I also think, um, and not to be accusatory in any way, it really sort of begs the question, why, why was that decision made? I'm just going to say that. <laughs> um, and thank you very much. <clears throat> I am going to just interrupt public comment for one moment. Just as a friendly reminder, at this point, ballots have been printed. So even if the council wanted to reconsider, that's not an option at this point. Um, so again, just a friendly reminder. State won't. Tell them state won't. No, it's a state, state statute. So next speaker, please. Um, my name is Lexi Jamison. I reside at 14 Caraman Circle. Um, I know a lot of these points have already been made, so I'll try to keep it brief. I spoke here just one week ago on the behalf of the Scarborough Key Club and the students involved in extracurriculars at our, in our schools. As a rising senior, I'm already well into my college search, and at every information, information session and from every college admissions rep that I've spoken to, I've heard the same thing over and over again. Colleges look for students who have invested their time in doing things that they love and getting involved in their communities. The future students of Scarborough will not be able to do so if our schools continue to take the hits of the budget every year. I know that when my parents moved to Scarborough over 16 years ago, one of the most important factors was the school system. They looked at the college that the graduating seniors of Scarborough were attending. All of these students that were in the top rank of Scarborough were attending competitive schools and even Ivy League schools. My question to you is how do you expect the alumni of Scarborough to receive a good secondary education if we can't even be challenged in our own school systems? This isn't just about what's going on in the present. It's about all of the futures of students of Scarborough schools. If we fight this budget battle every year, no one will be willing to move to this wonderful town and the school systems and quality of our town will continue to decrease. Thank you for your time. Somebody's going to have to remind me that I put my keys there. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I'm Hillary Durgan. I'm Sequoia Lane in Scarborough. Um, I believe schools are at the heart of any community, especially ours, and as a community, we have a responsibility to our school system and to our youngest citizens. We have a responsibility to fully fund our schools, and that includes small improvements each year. Unfortunately, we have not had improvements for our schools for many years now. They consistently do more with less, even though they are constantly battling to keep the funding at just level services. I believe that there should be some compromise and the town should heal from this divisive atmosphere. However, I don't think our children and their schools should be where we look for when we need to make tax cuts. I believe we should have level services for our schools for this year, and I hope that next year we can move above level services. I hope that you return the full $500,000 to our budget, and I thank you all for your time. Good evening, I'm Stacy Newman. I live at 17 Windsor Pines Drive. I am here to let you all know that while I wish that the full $500,000 was gonna be restored to the budget, I understand that it's not, and that I appreciate the compromise that everyone has come to at $250,000. My plea here tonight is that it would be a unanimous decision. I think our town has suffered a reputational loss, and I think with the unanimous vote by the town council on a budget that's then after supported, um, that will just really help our town's reputation. I also want to thank the school board for their tireless efforts in reaching cut after cut and trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And finally, I'm here to thank the parents very much for all that you've done for the schools and the towns. For everyone to know, I some stumbled upon this organization, I guess. I had no idea what I would help create. Um, and I'm so thankful for the parents. One thing that's interesting to me is many of the people that have stepped up and helped send emails or create signs or meet with people are not my friends. They're people that I didn't know. I probably don't have any friends left after this budget cycle, but um, aside from that, um, it's just people in the community who want a voice to be engaged. And I want to thank you all. Um, you should be proud of yourselves, and your children should be proud of you, and your town should be proud of you, because we are making steps. We're not going to go away. I think this is a compromise vote for this year, and it's what we should do. But from now on, I hope that we continue to fight and fund the schools, not just keep it at a declining budget. So thank you for your time. Hello, uh, my name is Karim Dudai. I live in uh, Six Haystack Circle. And notwithstanding the miserable Google results about Scarborough, I have failed miserably to hear from the town council how you plan to do better next year. I understand the compromise is the order of the day. Your body language tells me that. You have resigned yourself to the situation, and I accept that. I think the ball will move forward. But what you have not convinced me is three things. What is your vision? How do you plan to get from point A to point B, where we don't have this miserable argument anymore? What is your vision that enables you as a town council to leave a legacy for our kids? What is your vision that enables us to trust you that the vote we gave for you was a valid one? Tell me your vision. Tell us this town your vision. Instead of bickering and being meek about using the word compromise. Because if you have a vision, you won't need compromise. You will get it done. And therein lies the challenge for you. How are you going to get it done? Where is the execution of that vision? Certainly, in the last three months, your execution has been abhorrently lackadaisical. It has personally sucked. And the reason is, whether it's your failure to articulate or your failure to get together in the same room with the compatriots that you are supposed to work with, or whether it is your failing to be able to execute on what you said you would do, you have not executed. We are going to go and do another third round, notwithstanding, again, this printing thing. It's execution. Where is the can-do spirit that you've been entrusted with? You're sitting behind the seal of that town that was founded in 1658. You have an obligation of a can-do spirit. Where is that? Finally, where are the tools that are going to allow you to have a vision and execute? Please tell me. Tell me that you can be transparent. Tell me that you're willing to go line item by line item. 
tell me that you're willing to sit with your state legislators who can undo this mess. <coughs> tell me that you're willing to talk, not at the final 12th hour of a negotiation, but six months ago when you had some common spirit and some bond that allowed you to do a budget. Tell me you can actually answer those questions that was on a great flip chart. Tell me that you can actually ask questions of us. Tell me. I think you have heard some cogent arguments from many, many people. Articulate yours. Tell me. You're out of time, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. We were doing so good. <laughs> um, so I, I guess in similar fashion to Liam, I'm not here to tell you uh, or suggest one way or the other where you should go on the budget. I felt strongly that um, you worked hard and you came to a, a compromise at the last meeting. I'll be interested in, and certainly um, give thoughtful consideration to what you discussed tonight when I'm done speaking. But um, but I do have a vision, <laughs> and um, one of the things that I was thinking about it as I was sitting there, and I didn't intend to speak tonight, but I thought about my own schooling experience, and so I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I'm not a Mainer, um, and in Detroit, unfortunately, um, public school was not really an option in my neighborhood, um, and so for two reasons. One, I have a handicap, and the school was unwilling to serve me. Uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but then beyond that, it just the quality of the schools were not um, adequate. So parents sacrificed a great deal to send all of us through um, Catholic schools. And one of the things I was thinking about, and I thought, this is the answer. Um, in that Catholic school setting, um, we had all of these great capital fundraising events. We brought the community together. Um, you know, I, I know that might sound pie in the sky, and I know there's some legal uh, loopholes to jump through, um, but we have a great community here, and this energy that a lot of folks have spoken to tonight, um, I think we need to capitalize on that. Uh, I felt that same kind of energy uh, when I led the DOGS initiative a year and a half ago, and I feel it now, and I know um, that together we could really do some great things. So. Um, this Sunday, for example, I'm, I'm going to participate in the Try for a Cure, first time. I'm terrified. Uh, I mean, Cancer Foundation is close to a $1.5 million goal. Let's run a Scarborough Triathlon. You know, it's about finishing. It's about doing things together that you've never done. In order to get where you want to be, you have to take yourself out of your comfort zone and try something new. And I think that's my vision anyway. Um, I think you're still in, the, still in a really tough spot. Uh, I've heard a lot of people speak to wanting level services back. I, I don't think that's possible, uh, given the first vote, because you basically <laughs> would be telling those voters their voice didn't count. So uh, striking further compromise is really your only choice. Um, and, I, and I think that's about all I have to say for, this, for tonight, and good luck. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Kim Bridgham and I live at 204 Spurwink Road. I think the reason why the first budget didn't pass is because the parents didn't get out to vote. This is the second time in two years that the number of voters was appalling. If, if every parent with a kid in the Scarborough school system voted, if all of the kids who graduated this year and have the newly right to vote at 18 years old had gone to the polls, it would have passed the first time. And it's really disappointing to me that it takes all this angst for parents to get out and vote. And I know you guys are all here and obviously you feel very passionate about this, but we have to shame our friends and our kids into coming and voting the first time. We risk the chance of losing $500,000 in our budget and all those extracurricular activities or whatever other cuts need to be happen for the cost of a cup of Starbucks coffee once a week or the cost of eating, giving up that one lunch out and bringing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to work instead. And that's crazy. I'm going to vote for the – if the – Council votes for a $250,000 cut versus a $500,000 cut, I'm going to vote yes, so that maybe next year 
we'll all get out and vote when it matters, and all of this stuff won't be in the news. Anybody else wish to speak? All right. And saying that, I will close the public hearing. So we are on the second reading of the proposed fiscal year 2016 school budget. And is there a motion? Move the, uh, the first reading. And is there a second? Second. And I do have an amendment I would offer, but um, I did want to just offer if there's any discussion before prior to the amendment that I'm going to offer. Mm -mm. All right, <clears throat> bear with me, I'm losing my voice today. So this is in the form of a motion, budget order for fiscal year 2016 municipal school budget, whereas the Scarborough Town Council adopted fiscal year 2016 operational and capital budgets for the town and school on May 20th, 2015, with the passage of order number 15-026 and subsequently adopted an amended school budget on June 21st, 4th, 2015, with the adoption of order number 15-048. And whereas pursuant to state law, the school budget must be validated by the voters and it failed at special election held on June 9th, 2015 and July 7th, 2015. Whereas the town council must resubmit an adjusted school budget to the voters for validation no less than 10 days and no more than 45 days from the July 7th, 2015. The date of the next school budget validation referendum is set for August 4th, 2015. And whereas in an effort to reach a compromise, the town council appreciates the need to share in the responsibility of minimizing the impact on the property tax rate and therefore agrees to amend the fiscal year 2016 municipal budget. Now therefore be it ordered that the Scarborough Town Council moves forward an approval of the amended fiscal year 2016 town and school budget in second reading and be it further ordered that the school budget be increased by a total of $250,000 and therefore the Scarborough Town Council hereby appropriates for school purposes the education operating budget the new sum of $43,543,756. And that the additional GPA allocation of 884891 be included as school revenue, resulting in the town of Scarborough raising the sum of $37,659,488 as the local share for the education operating budget. Be it further ordered that the town budget is hereby amended to include an additional 200000 in excise tax revenue and to reduce town appropriations by 180000 Details of specific cuts to be recommended by the town manager and approved by the finance committee. For a new operating budget of 30505367 resulting in the local share for the municipal budget the sum of $17,391,450. Be it further ordered that the, town, the final result of these changes produces a new total but net budget of $57,830,277, resulting in a projected tax rate increase of 2.9%. That is in the form of a motion. Second. And discussion, or do you want discussion? Well, I, I, I can lead if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> so I guess um, the, the first comments I'll offer is that um, you know, I, I think, although it, I don't really have a good answer, I received a lot of feedback this week and inquiry about what we're talking about for 180000 and a reduction in the municipal budget. Um, I do not have an answer for that. Um, certainly the Finance Committee will have its, its work cut out for them. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, early on we had already, you know, Tom, God bless our manager, red lines 90% of things before it even came to Finance Committee. Finance also redlined a number of other items and initiatives and left several positions unfilled um, for essentially almost a flat budget for what is now the sixth year. Um, I don't envy you and I wish you the best of luck in trying to figure out how to continue to provide level services and avoid layoffs, which was the council goals in the process that when we went through back in December when we started as a seated group. So again, my hat's off to you and good luck in finding that. Um, and I understand that Tom will be offering to work closely with each of those departments in order to um, recognizing several of our departments came in not only flat but even in the negative. So 
um, trying to work diligently with those that, that it impacts the most. Um, with that, um, 250,000 is now the number that's on the table. Um, again, it, 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 it is a decrease. I think that at this point it represents a fair or balance between we had the 50,000, um, an original budget that passed re that was rejected, then it obviously failed at a second. Um, this number is between the two. I think that's fairly respectful of both votes at this point. Um, the other thing I might point out is, is although at this point that the school won't be able to be, quote, you know, necessarily true level service, I think they're probably going through the same exercises that we will be, which will be shared services. I, I know we already had one, but maybe we can find another position. And, you know, um, really reining in on the reimbursements on some of the things that we do for, um, you know, and I'm, I'm being very out there because I don't know that we can even negotiate on some of those, you know, firemen training and stuff because it's required for them to work for us. So I don't know. We'll figure it out. But um, the one thing I will say is that although um, it is a $250,000 reduction from the original proposed level service budget, um, again, I feel that is a, a respectable mutual amount that we should be able to reasonably agree to to try to move us forward. Um, there is some high points in this budget on, on both sides. Um, right now, I don't believe we'll be faced with layoffs on the municipal budget. And at this point, we do have um, something to be extremely proud of. We have a huge initiative with a laptop program moving forward. And then although we're, again, you know, 250 less on, on the school operating, we have a huge win on that this year. And, and with that is the cost associated with that. that um, realistically is being shared as a burden with, with the town as well. Um, so uh, although I'm holding my nose because I don't know where it's going to come from, um, I do plan on voting and supporting this. I hope my fellow councillors will join me. I think it's the right thing to do at this point. Um, and I, I will touch base, although I know um, I'm talking about my amendment Actually, I'll come back to that comment. Um, so, on my amendment, is there any other discussion or offers of support or opinion? Jean Marie. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking people for being involved, and I hope you all stay involved. Um, I know in listening to speakers over the last few weeks and, and emails that I've gotten, a couple of things have really stood out for me. Um, as a town, we need to decide whether or not we value our future, which is our children. Um, I know that's one reason that I was in teaching. That was one thing I was asked to write a paper about, is why are you in teaching? And I started out by saying, I teach because I touch the future. Um, and, I, and I still believe that. Um, that being said, you know, in a perfect world, I'd certainly be I'd love to give you all the money I could give you. However, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a very politicized one. Um, people need to understand that when you're on the town level, you're at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, when it comes to state funding, federal funding, mandates, you name it, we get hit with them. Um, and we're still recovering from a lot of, I think, personally think very bad decisions that were made by the state legislators in this town. Um, so I'm hopeful that the parents will remember they need to work on that level also. Um, I look at this as a start. It's not an end. I will be voting to support the 250, and I certainly appreciate the angst that this is causing some people at this table and sitting across from me um, on the school board, but I think as a way to move forward, to use this again not as a finish, but this is a starting point that I encourage the people of this town, the voters of this town, number one, to get out and vote. Because if you don't vote, I don't want to hear from you. And number two, to vote yes on, on this $250,000 amendment. Um, so that's, that's where I am. Thank you. And uh, Peter? Yeah, and I guess, um, Actually, I'm going to support this too. And actually, what I was really glad to hear tonight, and, and you know, and I think other speakers had said it pretty eloquently tonight. There's probably both sides are not going to be happy with this. But what I did hear is a little bit of different language. And, and no matter where we were on this issue, what I did hear is people saying, 
um, really looking forward to changing the process for next year so we don't end up in this same place. So I really, that, that was a great dialogue. I really hope that we can do that, learn from this and move forward so next year we have a much healthier process. So I was really encouraged to kind of hear those words tonight, so I, I will support this. I think it's a good compromise. Ed? Um, I also am going to support this. Uh, as my fellow counselors know that <laughs> very, very rarely support anything over 2%. It's a win. Thank you, Ed. A win. <laughs> it's a win. <laughs> we can be this one I'm going to support. <laughs> And I did have the opportunity to meet with several parents uh, this week and had a very enjoyable conversation with them and hopefully a, a conversation that uh, will open up some ideas. I encourage parents to start thinking uh, with each other on ideas mm -hmm. to improve the schools, to improve the town government, um, we can't just work on a budget process. We have to work on the, the nitty-gritty, the stuff that really makes up the dollars and how are we really spending them. Um, and I encourage everybody to get involved in that. I know the town council is going to get heavily involved in that this coming year. Uh, and that's it. Um, I think John had the head nod first. Come on first. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that you have the right to have certain expectations of us. I think you have the right to expect that we're going to do a responsible job of budgeting. Uh, no one should see their uh, tax bills skyrocketing and then dropping. Uh, predictable rates, I think, are something that we've sh strived for in the two years that I've been on the council and I'll try and maintain that as a benchmark of trying to come to conclusions. But the second thing which I think you have an expectation from us is to have certain values about what's important. Uh, there is nothing more important than our school system. When you look at it, it makes sense from everybody's point of view. It makes sense from the taxpayer's point of view, protects his property values, uh, uh, keeps the uh, 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 children of the school engaged, and the lady who spoke on extracurricular, extracurricular activities, I think was her name was Spooner, I could not have agreed with her more about the value of these things. These, it's the socialization of the, the kids. How do they learn to be good citizens? That's what we're really doing. We're not just trying to teach them a little arithmetic, a little English. Uh, we're trying to make sure that they come out as good citizens, rounded uh, with knowledge and analytical skills, and it takes a full effort. So uh, uh, the thing out of this compromise, I think, is that, uh, and it's really the silver lining, is school supporters are energized. That's, that is a wonderful outcome. Uh, to have uh, for our community. Uh, and I think that uh, I have the tremendous respect for the, your school board, tireless workers, very capable people at running the school, and uh, passionate about education, and uh, difficult to compromise, very difficult to compromise uh, because of the circumstances that were presented here. So. I appreciate that, but I also think uh, that the town council did a remarkable thing in chipping in. That was, uh, was uh, very valuable to show that we could share a responsibility to arrive at a responsible budget increase. And that's what we've done, so that people who are tax conscious can appreciate this, uh, uh, but at the same time, we didn't do damage serious damage to the school system, and let's all work together next year to try and make it better. John? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, to uh, Councilor Donovan, who started this uh, conversation of finding a compromise, I want to say thank you, because I think that it started um, a positive dialogue, and if anything, the um, 
greatest achievement is the citizen input and the outcome uh, from that dialogue opening. Um, you know, we might get a lot of criticism from other communities and a part of me just says I don't care what other people think. Um, because when you do have a community that has 26% of its voters come out and vote on a school budget that totals more than every <laughs> community around us, including the city of Portland that has, what, 75,000 people in it, and we have more that showed up for our school budget than they did for theirs. Um, I'm actually very proud of that input and that engagement, and I can't remember the young lady's name, but um, I agree with her, and that is I don't think that we have a community that is divided. I think it's very clear where this community stands, and I'm really excited about the fu promise for future engagement because um, it's extremely important as chair of the Finance Committee and working with Mr. Chiazzo. I think we had a total of about 15, maybe 20 meetings, and we had the same five people show up at every meeting, and two of them spoke on a regular basis. And so, you know, one of the things that I do or try to do as a counselor is I try to gauge decisions that the community has made, and this community has made some decisions that kind of supported the outcome of that first referendum. We have three very strong legislators who have taken a very um, strong position around their conservativeness up at the State House that has not supported education. One has completely voted no on every time that there is an increased request. The others voted yes, but then voted no and um, wanted to upheld the, uphold the governor's veto of the additional monies. It's that volatility that has created the problem. Mm -hmm. It is not our process that created that problem. It's their volatility. So when Moody's comes out two days after <laughs> we deal with this and they give us a negative credit rating or a negative opinion about the state's budget and the dependence on the local tax base and particularly the lack of funding for education, it should be noted. <clears throat> it should also be noted the irony of today's announcement in which the governor gave his top staff an average pay increase of, what, 4%? Mm -hmm. But yet we're the drunken sailors because we want to give 2% to our teachers and to our policemen and, and to all the other staff. So there is a contradiction when we as a community vote for that type of representation and get that representation at the state level that provides us. If we had known of the better outcome of the 884,000, and I remember the manager telling me, I can't believe you're going to make an announcement that you think it's going to be 600,000. <laughs> when I saw the 884, I was elated um, because it's just never known. Um, as far as the request for the additional 70,000, I mean, this is in, in total, this is a $73 million budget and $70,000 has um, somehow kept us apart. Um, I'll be honest, and I've told this to the councilors, I was actually prepared to come in and offer the, an amendment to give back or to put the whole amount in because 884 is significantly higher than what I even expected. And if I had known, I don't think we would have come to the same outcome. Um, and I agree, I think it was Mr. Rowan, if I got the name right. Um, his numbers are absolutely correct. If we get back to 320, the total, without knowing the assessed valuations, the total tax rate was 3.35. If we take the averages, or even if we just looked to last year, an additional $15 million increase would have got us still below 3%. Because we don't look at the entire picture, and he's the first one that really has looked at the entire picture as, as far as the numbers come. And I was very comfortable with that, but I think that it's very clear, both from the um, citizens' input, from input from the school board, and input from the town council. I really want this council to have one voice on this matter, and I think it's very important that we move it forward. Um, I also hope that um, long term, um, my vision is very clear. It has been what we've stated as part of our goals. But I will tell you that one of the things I'm working with, at least with um, Senator Millett, who represents a small part of Scarborough, but she's on the Education Committee, and I hope the school board and the rest of the council will join me in lobbying two fundamental changes that will help us going forward. One is the change in the funding formula that puts a cap or a ceiling on the rate of change from every given year so that you don't have a 21, 22% change in one year. The community can't handle that volatility. Um, but it would also be a change that you couldn't receive more than 21%. So there's some number that needs to be added to, the, to that. The second is to eliminate the state requirement that we vote on a school budget. Um, as a community, rather than holding the town council and the school board accountable for the decisions that it's made, which it did for, I gotta do the math, uh, what, 1658 to 2008, <laughs> that's how we did it. And we survived, um, you know, we have very good schools and I know that we can do that again because we are held accountable for those decisions. Um, I think there could be a provision in there where RSUs, um, because they have a greater okay. challenge with multiple towns, could give an exception and should be encouraged to have that vote by communities our size um, should have that autonomy and to be able to go through that and then you hold us accountable. Last but not least, I, I disagree with criticism that the process is broken. 
I just don't agree with that. I think the part that, and we've talked about this today in our leadership meeting, I think the part that broke down was voter apathy and then communicating between both of our boards after the budget process went through that first referendum. And we, you know, I know I, we have a commitment from the chairwoman of the school board and the, and the finance chair as well as on our side that we're gonna look at starting this a little earlier. Uh, we're gonna look at how we can improve that communication and be more open about that. But um, we did an extensive process. No process is perfect first time out of the gate. Um, and I think that we're going to grow on this and we're gonna be able to advance our, our uh, responsibilities and our initiatives. So um, I am going to vote in favor of this. Um, and I hope that everyone in the community votes for it as well. Anybody else on the amendment? All right, well, just to recap, so um, this is not the main order, it's my amendment. So what the amendment does is um, one, this one small change is instead of 180 for the school as a reduction in increased expenditures, it will be a 250 reduction. Um, we will increase and accept the GPA revenue of 884 into this year as revenue for the school. And the town will reduce expenditures in its operating by a total of 180,000. And we will be applying an additional increase in excise revenue for 200,000. So again, that was my amendment that I offered in a very wordy legal speak. So all those in favor of the amendment. And that is unanimous. Back to the main motion. Does anybody wish to discuss the main motion of the fiscal year 2016 school operating budget? All right, well, back to me. Um, although I appreciate all the comments, um, I saved mine because that was the amendment. <laughs> so now that we're back to the main motion, I'll talk a little bit about some of the other stuff. Um, you know, I had talked about I just something that, you know, Sean had mentioned um, with his comments. You know, I've certainly talked about that before. Um, you know, I, certainly the referendum process is a little bit daunting simply because, you know, the, the, the steps that took place to present that had to do with school consolidations. Right. And, you know, clearly we're, we're not a consolidated unit. Um, we have, you know, a representative form of government. We have, you know, town council. We have a school board. Uh, and, and I have mentioned that before, you know, really taking a, a better look at our, our state statutes that require this and trying to work with our legislatures um, and, and maybe even being open to the thought of a cap. You know, if it's under this percentage, we're not going to referendum, and if it needs to go over this percentage, sure. it goes to referendum. Um, you know, I, I've talked about that before. I think it's a great idea. The trick is you need a legislator to sponsor it. So. Um, <laughs> You know, and certainly we can try to reach out again. You know, we've talked about that, trying to, um, you know, budget has kind of stalled that a little bit, but what we have talked about this year moving forward, that we were going to try to continue to work with our legislatures about some ideas that we as a municipality and leaders of our community feel would be important and vital for Scarborough. Um, and um, September, September is the magic month. There's a lot of discussion about, um, you know, again, to move forward a little bit with this budget, and then what are we going to be doing in the future? Um, the quick answer to that is just so every councillor knows, our first meeting in September, we will be revisiting budget and the goals for that and the lessons learned and how to move forward and what we might like to change and what we thought worked good and what it didn't and have um, start that process even in September so that it moves forward into the next year. Um, one other small little note is also our county tax increase every year. That's good for about, what, 200000 if I... 250. 250. Um, it's not a number we get to argue. It's a bill that gets handed to us. It, it's no different than your household tax bill. We get a tax bill every year from the county, and it goes up. Um, you know, there are some uncontrollable costs, but, but it would be worth the argument of, well, what are we getting? <laughs> we, we don't use county... Sheriff's Department, we, we know, what, what are we getting? And every year we're getting a bigger bill. Um, so again, I think that might be a good conversation to kind of wrap our heads around a little bit. And then the last one, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that have asked why, um, I, I won't speak for the other counselors, I'm only gonna speak for myself, about the Goldilocks question. 
Uh, I myself, for, for the reason why I voted to, you know, in support of removing it, is for um, a pretty simple reason. Um, for me, the Goldilocks question is to gauge the temperature of the community with the first budget and even in the second budget. I didn't personally feel it necessary um, or added any value um, to where to go if this referendum failed. We had a too high number, we had a too low number. We were going to be somewhere between that. If that number failed again, it was going to go up. Um, it, it was not a question in my mind. It's, it's, it was kind of irrelevant. Um, I didn't feel that I needed that in, to move in another direction. Um, so with that, um, is there any other comments before we, Sean? Just a couple of points I wanted to, uh, so I'm uh, actually um, hopefully going to be appointed at the end of this month onto the County Advisory, uh, Budget Advisory Committee. So just to clarify, um, our portion is about $250,000, at least that's the um, increase for this year. Mm. Right now, one of the 71 bills that are going before the Supreme Court to determine whether or not it's been vetoed or actually a law is a bill, <laughs> a bill that actually addresses the underfunding of about $4.5 million. Um, if that bill doesn't pass, and by the way, the reason why this is important is because Scarborough is the third largest contributor to county, the county budget, yeah. based on, and it's based on size and population. Um, we could see next year, um, in the next budget cycle, we could see that $250,000 increase become somewhere around $500,000 to $600,000 just, just from the county government. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you continue watching that, so I do appreciate you bringing that up. Um, the last one I wanted to bring up was this issue around the Goldilocks that was uh, removed. Um, and I've been blunt, ever since I think it was 2008 or 2009, I've never appreciated um, this question. Um, the reason for bringing that question in was because of uh, voters not following directions and how they completed their ballot. It wasn't because the council wanted to have more information about how and what the intent of the voters were. And that's because when you don't fill out the ballot properly, it invalidates it, which can, you know, construe a different outcome, obviously, as if you don't know it. So that's why it was created. It had nothing to do with, and I hate to say it, had nothing to do with wanting to know what you really wanted. Um, <laughs> that doesn't really sound good, did it? <laughs> But I, but I remember the conversation. It was, it was because we wanted to make, I mean, how, however, what's important, I wanted to mention it, what's important is that the outcome of, of a, a referendum vote doesn't tell me where you want to go in the future. It tells me that we made either a good decision or a bad decision. And, and I think it's, it takes place of complacency of being involved in that process that is required uh, to continue the dialogue so that we know where to go. Um, just think if we didn't get this dialogue, how would we know what too low meant? Um, and that's what we needed to hear. So um, I never appreciated the question, never wanted the question. That's why I, I voted that way, and I would rather not see the question going forward, even at the first one. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I actually wasn't going to say much tonight, but um, mostly because I didn't actually think I had, um, had it in me to, to talk about it, but I'm going to. Um, I, before I sat on this council, if I was on the other side, I would be wearing red right beside you, pounding the pavement, doing exactly what you were doing. Um, sitting on the other side sometimes gives you a different perspective and a different outlook on things. Um, but one thing I wouldn't do um, is I would never attack a counselor who has lost a child, ever. So if those people are in this room that decided to email me and use my son's name like that, you should be ashamed of yourself. I would never do that. That does not mean that you can't send, a, send me an email that says, I don't agree with what you're saying, or I think you should, you should be embarrassed or ashamed. You can attack me any day. But my children do not vote for me. They do not speak for me. Attacking my children that are, that are still living in my house is one thing that I'm not, I'm not going to push back on. But to bring up my son that passed away two years ago, in my opinion, is horrifying and uncalled for. So I will support the schools as best I can. When I voted for that $500,000 cut, I did it because I thought that it was a good balance between the people that we hear from that need um, tax relief and for the schools. Now that we're back at it, we've heard what you've had to say, and now we're trying to fix what has been done. And we're still trying to meet, make everybody happy, and it's impossible. But we are trying. 
There isn't a single, I never speak for other counselors, but I can tell you there is not a single counselor up here that wants to hurt a child in this town. In fact, I think every single one of us are parents. We have children. But shaming a counselor is not the way to do it. And it should be you should be embarrassed. And if you are sitting in this room, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. My son deserves better and does not deserve to have his name desecrated like that. I'm sorry. No, I'm um, done. <clears throat> I, I do want to thank Counselor St. Clair for coming forward with that. Um, you know, it's something I'm acutely aware of. Um, she has shared some of those emails with me. Um, I was aware of them at the last meeting, I, I, although I did kind of touch on some of my comments in the last meeting as to the appropriateness of, of some of and some of the behavior of what's going on in the community. Um, it certainly was not my place to, to bring that up. So um, I do applaud you and your strength for bringing that up and, and coming forward with it. I think it's vital and important for people to hear. Um, and, and certainly I, my, my heart goes out to you and I 110% agree with you. It is disgusting to use the death of a child to lobby for an opinion. Um, so with that, I, I'll leave that comment where it is. So, we are on the main motion. Is there any other discussion? All right, well, um, my last little parting words here before we take a roll call vote will be, is just a friendly reminder, um, my, <laughs> please get out and vote. I, I hope you can vote yes. Um, and I do just want to also um, remind everybody, um, let's try to keep it civil, just go around, you know, whatever your opinion is, let's try to be somewhat, you know, agreeable, and, and if you can't agree with your neighbors, then so be it, um, agree to disagree, but please, please, please join us in, in voting in support of this budget. So, roll call vote. Councilor Baybine? Yes. Councilor Donovan? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor Blaze? Yes. Councilor St. Clair? Yes. Councilor Chair Holbrook? Yes. And with that is item number four, which is a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? And that is unanimous.